Hi everyone, okay, we're going to start. So, thank you very much for coming along to this Crest seminar. I think this is the first one we've had in person for about two and a half years or something, two years. So, it's lovely to be back here. It's fantastic to have Rosie as our first in person, a real person. Um, Chris, Chris Seminar presenter, uh, and on such an interesting topic, I think it's going to be quite controversial. I'm hoping it's going to be quite controversial, Rosie. Right? Okay. On transparency, all us persons said we were going on talking about congruence, and now Rose is going to tell us why congruence in what you're searching may be not as great as we think it is. Transparency. 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 So, I think most of you know Rosie. Rosie is a professor of psychoanalytic psychotherapy. Right. Here at the university. How long have you been at the university for Rosie? Not long, maybe. Much too long. Much too long. <laughs> Much too long to say, but he's one of our most esteemed professors here at the university and also in the UK, really. And so there's not many of us professors of psychoanalysis, psychotherapy. So Rosie is an absolute star. And it's fantastic to have her presenting. So we're going to do about 50 minutes. Rosie's going to talk for about 50 minutes. And then we'll have time for some questions and discussion. <coughs> Can I just say how lucky we are to be able to have a psychology seminar at all at the moment? It feels a real luxury, doesn't it? With what's going on in the world, wars, pandemics, God knows what. And here we are, able to be here tonight. So I just want to recognise how lucky we are to have the luxury of sitting together. Um, and I want to thank Mick for asking me to do this talk and pushing me to think about this topic of transparency, which has interested me for a long time, but it really pushed me to think about it in relation to our research. So um, I'm hoping, I'll, I'm probably not going to talk for quite as much as 50 minutes, probably for nearer 40, um, and then I'm hoping we can have a really good discussion after that. So let me start by going back to the spring of 1851 where in London's Hyde Park, the great exhibition has just opened, a tremendous opportunity for Victorian Britain to display its industrial, military, and economic power. There are 14,000 exhibitors, mainly from Britain's colonies, but also from other countries across the world. And they're displaying over 100,000 of the finest examples of scientific, technological, and cultural progress developed during the Industrial Revolution. The exhibits are displayed in cases that stretch for more than 11 miles. They include pottery, porcelain, jewelry, ironwork, and steel. There are telegraphs, microscopes, surgical instruments, steam hammers, hydraulic presses, and even houses. The exhibition runs from May to October, and in those six months, it will attract over six million visitors, almost a third of the population of the UK at the time. And it's destined to be the single most successful public event ever staged in the UK. The biggest attraction though, is not the vast array of exhibits. It's the extraordinary building in which they're all housed, Joseph Paxton's Crystal Palace, a vast temporary structure made entirely of glass and iron. Paxton was a horticulturist and gardener to the Duke of Devonshire, and his design for Crystal Palace drew on new materials and methods of construction that made it possible to produce relatively cheap sheet glass. Nearly 300,000 panes of glass, covering an area of almost a million square feet, are used in his creation. The sight of it, says Queen Victoria in her letter, was incredibly glorious, really like fairyland. And in fact, it's evident from newspaper reports at the time that the feelings evoked by the huge opening ceremony are profound, almost religious in nature. The event is attended by the Archbishop of Canterbury, prayers are said, and Handel's Hallelujah Chorus is sung by a choir of over 600 people. But the most striking quality of the Crystal Palace was undoubtedly the extraordinary transparency of the building. But what was concealed behind all those panes of glittering glass? Over a hundred years later, Foucault will draw on Benton's panoramic <coughs> prison design to demonstrate the controlling effects of transparency, suggesting that it doesn't actually expose 
so much as hives. <coughs> the transparent structure of the crystal palace evidently operated as a kind of panopticon, enabling <coughs> six million people to inspect the commodities on display while at the same time affording visitors, the new consumer class, the opportunity to continually scrutinize and evaluate each other. But paradoxically, the architecture's very transparency also served to conceal the workings of an imperial power determined to advance a formidable industrial program. But despite the religious fervor accompanying its opening, the Crystal Palace was no glass cathedral. It was essentially a free trade exhibition, one that was there to promote the interests of British industry and commerce, to make a profit. And despite the exhibition being open to all, including for the first time the working classes, who were all a special cheap rent, the exhibition and the economy it was there to celebrate were accompanied by poverty, unemployment, and exceptionally harsh working and living conditions for much of the population. In this paper, I want to take the Crystal Palace as our starting point for a critical inquiry into the preeminent status of transparency within research and psychological therapies. It's considered foundational to scientific inquiry that the credibility of any knowledge claims accrued by research should rest on the transparency of the methods and measures we deploy in the research process. But as Judith Butler reminds us, the primary task of critique is not simply to evaluate whether certain practices or forms of knowledge are good or bad, but rather, as she says, to bring into relief the very framework of evaluation itself. So my purpose tonight is not to praise or condemn transparency, but rather to explore how its epistemology authorizes and privileges a frame of reference that may exclude other perspectives on knowing and knowledge. So I'm making a plea here for thinking carefully about transparency's moral and discursive claims to legitimacy, and for considering how these govern the way we think about ourselves and about our research. Along the way, I'll suggest there may be forms of knowing and knowledge incompatible with the principles of transparency, and which only emerge in practices that circulate outside their jurisdiction. <clears throat> so let's start with transparency as a word that derives from the word, the Latin trans, meaning across, beyond, or through, and parere, to appear, to come into sight. Transparency implies something emerging from, or shining through, something coming to light. And light, as preeminent symbol of visibility, reason, and progress, embodies an ideal that derives directly from the Enlightenment, a time when the authority of the church, the state, and the monarchy was called into question. This paved the way to free speech, individualism, and an empirical attitude where to see is to know. Like democracy with which it's synonymous, transparency stands for all that's open, accessible, and true. And indeed, contemporary democratic governments and systems must vigorously demonstrate transparency in order to be seen as reliable, dependable, and free from corruption. Our insistence on open government, freedom of information, informed consent, and the public's right to know has today been elevated to a supreme value. Clarity and visibility are associated with responsible decision making predicated on established rules and procedures that are evident to all. From government ministers' expenses scandals to more recent revelations about love affairs, lobbying rules, and Christmas parties, the requirement for transparency is usually considered axiomatic, natural, obvious, and beyond question. But if we're to think critically, we might from the outset want to question what's apparently so self-evident. As we've seen, transparency started with the Enlightenment as a tool invented to expose and ensure the proper functioning of a representative government. It's since become a household name for us with the introduction of new public management strategies during the 1980s. A business ontology privileging marketization, accountability, bureaucracy, and economic rationalism 
is now widely deployed in order to make public services and institutions more visible, efficient, and responsive to customer need. What started off then as a means of liberation from the ancien regime has over time evolved into our contemporary transparency agenda, a modern day regime of control, legitimation, accountability and governance, where a commitment to operating under the scrutiny of citizens and stakeholders alike is assumed. Transparency is now a global good, proffered as a solution to a range of social, economic, educational, corporate and environmental problems. Perhaps though, we should hesitate before too readily committing ourselves to transparency's progressive and emancipatory ideals. My scepticism here is not simply on account of transparency's unintended consequences and its rather obvious failure to make good those political promises to improve trust and public safety. Rather, it's because its principles of disclosure, visibility and revelation yield knowledge claims that are privileged as neutral and objective. I'm interested in forms of disclosure that generate knowledge claims of a rather different order, And I'll suggest these emerge from modes of disclosure that rely more on secrecy, ambiguity and opacity than on openness, clarity and lucidity. Indeed, transparency is often unfavourably compared to secrecy, a word that nowadays stands for all that's anti-democratic, corrupt and taboo. Secrecy is disparaged as a tool of ideology and unaccountable power, in contrast to transparency, which is championed as an agent of change and effectiveness. But if we examine the origin of the word secret, we learn it means to set apart or divide, to withdraw, exclude, or separate something off. So we could say the secret is something that is separated off from what can be known. Perhaps this is why Derrida tells us that in transparency, the secret is never broached or breached. If I am to share something, to communicate, objectify, thematize, the condition is there be something non thematizable non-objectifiable, non-shareable. And this something, he says, is an absolute secret. What we can know then emerges out of what we cannot know, the absolute secret that doesn't yield to excavation, to transparency. Secrecy, as Derrida goes on to say, does not consist in hiding something, in not revealing the truth but rather in respecting the absolute singularity, the infinite separation of what binds me or exposes me to the unique. Derrida seems to be pointing towards secrecy as an inherent quality of otherness, an irreplaceable uniqueness that cannot be shared and perhaps never could be shared. But as researchers operating within transparency's epistemology, we seem to believe there is a secret that can be unearthed and shared. Perhaps as researchers, we hope we can track it down, trapping it under a grid of measures that will one day pluck the secret from the heart of therapy. But Derrida has something more to tell us about the nature of the absolute secret. Its meaning, he says, is not available to information. Secrecy, he says, is not a thing, some information I'm hiding, or that one has to hide or dissimulate. It is rather an experience that does not make itself available to information, that resists information and knowledge, and that immediately encrypts itself. So whilst there are things that can be known, there's a quality of unknownness that's not amenable to the domain of knowledge available to transparency. The absolute secret is not something we can easily see, grasp or comprehend. It's rather an experience which we can only with difficulty sense or apprehend. It cannot be cognitively perceived or intellectually mastered and indeed may not even be articulated as knowledge at all. And I'm going to return to this domain of knowledge later on. Transparency in research doesn't only rely on the assumption that to see is to know. 
It relies on the presumption that everything can and must be converted into information. When we undertake research, the object of our interest is rendered into abstract, codified fragments of information that in today's digitized and commodified world can be saved, stored, collated, and manipulated. In other words, it can be bought and sold. These items of data, such as PHQ-9, GAD-7, or Core-10 scores, are indices that can be appropriated in a way deemed to be scientific, objective, neutral, and apolitical. But let's remember that information cannot speak for itself. It requires a human perspective to read, understand, and think about what it means. And as we know, this is central to our qualitative research, where narrative accounts of lived experience can only be read and interpreted in the light of the specific social, cultural, political, and economic context from which they emerge. For now, I want to turn to some of the basic tools of traditional psychotherapeutic outcome research, the protocol, the policy, and above all, the manual. These are the means by which words are transformed into information, ensuring our processes are as transparent as possible. It's accountability that's at stake here. What exactly are you investigating? Can you demonstrate that the model of therapy or psychological intervention you're researching is the one you say it is? How do you define what you mean by a successful outcome? There's an absolute insistence in this epistemology on specifying in detailed, explicit language exactly what we do as clinicians, how we do it, and with what specifiable outcomes. To be sure, there may be good reasons for establishing these things accurately and verifiably. But I sometimes think there's a particular problem with manualization. This is because it implicitly relies on a model of clinical work that treats words as information and therapy as some kind of straightforward exchange of information between therapist and patient. This presupposes a linear relationship between what's said and what is heard. In other words, there's an assumption that everybody says what they mean and others have access to that same <coughs> meaning in an unproblematic way. What we might call this informational model of research presumes a predictable relationship between the words that are spoken in therapy and any clinical outcome that ensues. Now, the end result of this can be seen in programs like the UK government's Improving Access to Psychological Therapies. Predicated on the mass provision of evidence-based therapies as recommended by the NICE guidelines, IAPT has been described by David Clark as a unique exercise in public transparency. In its policies and protocols, we're presented with the familiar discourse of evidence-based practice, and we're asked to accept the idea that we should offer people, and I quote, the appropriate dose of therapy as if one can be prescribed the right information in the right form of words in the same way as one can be prescribed the right antibiotic or vaccine. Medical drugs, as we know all too well these days, are scientifically tested to prove they work. So it's not surprising we might also want to know that the words we deploy in therapy are scientifically proved to work too. The use of a drug metaphor here implies we might need to be as careful with our language as with our medicines. For words can have powerful effects, particularly, it said, when they've been empirically tested to produce desirable outcomes, and even more when they're professionally accredited and scientifically authorised as evidence-based. Indeed, the transparency agenda ensures the most powerful, most effective form of words is now impounded within professional guidelines and manuals. These specify with the greatest of care how and by whom and with what credentials they may be used. But in a research environment where words must be so tightly monitored, managed, and manualized, I can't help wondering what it is about them that makes us all quite so anxious. Behind our obsession with the effectiveness of words in therapy, I suggest lies an ancient dilemma. 
one that goes back as far as Plato's doubts about rhetoric as the artificer of persuasion. On the one hand, there is our tremendous belief in the power of words to persuade, to influence, to change ourselves and the world. On the other, an equally tremendous scepticism about the ability of words to do anything at all in the face of the kind of psychological pain and suffering we see daily in our consulting rooms. So when as researchers we ask which therapy is the most effective, perhaps we're asking, as George Seferis asks of poetry, whether words are really strong enough to help. The importance of finding words strong enough to help reminds us that the work we do as clinicians and researchers is always in and through language. And it's here the notion of words as information is likely to get the researcher into trouble. For we must acknowledge that the words we use in therapy are not or not only information, and they don't live in manuals any more than they do in dictionaries. Rather, they live in the minds and mouths of people who think and speak them. They will mean different things to different people at different times. So although much psychotherapeutic outcome research is aimed at finding a form of therapy that is scientifically acknowledged to be effective, there can surely be no possibility of us ever establishing the best therapeutic language, <coughs> one that is universally effective, one that is strong enough to help everyone, everywhere, for all time. Even if we believe outcome research is aimed more specifically at what works best for who, the culturally alluring discourse of science with its medical and neuroscientific lexicon tells a different story. Knowledge claims that emerge from research couch in this powerful discourse aim to disinfect language of its personal memories and associations, tilting it along an empirical evaluative axis. This kind of language may well be scientific. On that basis, it's often assumed to be strong enough to help most people but not everyone will respond to it in the same way. More importantly, it's the standardising kind of language that risks flattening and restricting the possibilities of personhood, subordinating individuals to what Heidegger calls orderability. Part of the difficulty with the transparency agenda is that its moral and discursive legitimacy rests on the exclusions of practices whose knowledge claims resist its call to clarity. Following the critical theorist Claire Birchall, I want to interrupt the hegemony of transparency by considering the value of knowledge claims emerging from practices that do not accept transparency as the ideal model. Instead, I'm interested in practices such as poetry and psychoanalysis that adopt the rather different principles of concealment, opacity, and secrecy. I'm going to start here by referring to the work of the Martinican poet and cultural critic Edouard Lisson. He frames transparency and its practices of visibility as a serious problem. Lisson takes issue with colonial tendencies to reduce people to models, groups, categories that offer a false sense of understanding in the interests of maintaining control. He's opposed to what he calls the ideal of a transparent universality imposed by Western perspectives. He argues instead that modernity has naturalized and legitimated the right to transparency in a way that's always bolstered imperial control and economic domination. I always think he must have had much to say about the great exhibition at Crystal Palace. For those commodities under all that glittering glass were brought over by enslaved people from countries seized by the British. Gleason suggests we resist demands to be known via reductive economic and calculative frameworks currently colonizing society, and that we safeguard our own and others' right to be understood otherwise. Instead of stipulating transparency, he demands opacity, something constituted by a stubborn core of otherness or difference that's only ever partially available or knowable. In fact, he goes further, petitioning for the right to opacity, in other words, demanding the political right 
not to be reduced to universal one-size-fits-all terms, but construct the other as an object of knowledge. Gleason is primarily interested in the role of literature, especially poetry, as a model for the kind of opacity that he's interested in. I've also become very interested in how our experience of a poem is largely dependent on its resistance to intellectual analysis and explanation. We could say the poem's meaning is disclosed by way of opacity and ambiguity rather than by way of clarity and definition. So it's not as if there's some kind of meaning or knowledge within the poem that's transparently sitting there, waiting to be exposed and articulated. What we're able to glean from a poem sits within a different register of knowledge and time. As an example, let's take Elizabeth Bishop's poem, At the Fish Houses, written in 1948. This beautiful poem is a kind of allegory of our engagement with knowledge, language, and memory in the world. It begins with a long introduction that describes an old fisherman scraping the silver scales from fish that have just arrived fresh off the fishing boats in the harbour. Bishop then describes the backdrop to this scene, a cold northern sea. Cold, dark, deep and absolutely clear, element bearable to no mortal, she tells us. If you should dip your hand in, your wrist would ache immediately. If you tasted it, she goes on to write, it would first taste bitter, then briny, then surely burn your tongue. It is like what we imagine knowledge to be. Dark, salt, clear, moving, utterly free. So Bishop is telling us that knowledge in this poetic register, <coughs> the kind of knowledge that perhaps forms the backdrop to all other knowledge, is not something to be encountered directly, but is rather something to be recognised by resemblance and through an act of imagination. We're at least two removes from knowledge here, where we can only know something to be like what we imagine knowledge to be. Our knowing is dependent not on a rapid, masterful intellectual grasp, but rather on reaching out towards the more gradual, unfolding disclosure of something experienced by way of comparison that allows us to sense and imagine it otherwise. Now, it's easy to be dismissive of this hesitant kind of knowledge. And we might tell ourselves that it's irrelevant, literary, or just ornamental. <coughs> but is this not because it interrupts our preferred, empirically verifiable, scientific ways of seeing or knowing something? What does it mean when seeing or reading something doesn't yield to immediate illumination so much as to open on to a way of knowing something that renders it more ambiguous more mysterious and infinitely stranger. Perhaps as researchers we don't always allow ourselves time for this. We're hampered by the difficulty, if not the impossibility, of exempting ourselves from transparency's moral prerogative. For insofar as transparency is synonymous with democracy, the subject of democracy is today increasingly obliged, obliged to demonstrate his or her transparent credentials to perform transparency as it were. As researchers then, we will have to perform our research in ways that conform to the demands of a transparent, information-driven society. Again, I'm very far from claiming this is redundant. Transparency does have significant justifications. And as we find ourselves in the midst of this gathering war, we know that the workings of government do need to be visible. Democratically elected representatives do need to be held accountable. And so it follows in our much smaller way that our research methods, measures and processes do need to be made visible and available to others. Yet if this the transparency agenda claims to see is to know, then is it too easy and too tempting to assume human beings can be seen and can be known, that we can and do have access to ourselves and we can therefore account for ourselves and for those whose thoughts and behavior we're investigating. Now this tremendous claim, the claim of the sovereign autonomous self who produces, possesses and displays herself, 
the self who can be known to others, I think is the fantasy of transparency that this very brief critical inquiry is trying to interrogate. By privileging the total visibility of information, the transparency agenda mandates the total visibility of the self. And so at this point, I want to push the envelope of our inquiry a bit further and shift from poetry to psychoanalysis. For psychoanalysis, like poetry, is a practice whose knowledge claims are dependent on a certain lack of transparency. Indeed, in psychoanalysis, the therapist deliberately cultivates a stance of neutrality or opacity that's crucial to the development of that creative illusion we call transference. When unconscious feelings derived from early childhood relationships are located and enacted within the therapeutic relationship, the therapist will certainly come to know something about his or her patient. But this knowledge won't arrive ready-made in the form of data or information. It won't necessarily announce itself in empirical terms. Indeed, it may not even be thought of or articulated as knowledge at all. This is the kind of knowledge that's more likely to become available as a counter-transferential feeling or embodied sensation. For this reason, psychoanalyst Christopher Bolas calls this kind of knowledge the unthought known. And even though psychoanalysis is predicated on a wish for self-knowledge and relies on the patient's cooperation in exploring difficult thoughts and feelings, there are surely limits to what we can know ourselves. Psychoanalytic theory reminds us our subjectivity is given over to the other from the start as a condition of our primary relationality. From our earliest moments, we are unconsciously shaped and influenced by our relationship to the other. <coughs> we are also inflected by invisible cultural norms, power hierarchies, and normative discourses that we're born into and to which we wittingly or unwittingly subscribe. We're always already inscribed by a radically unknowable alterity propelling our psychic life, our subjectivity, and our speech. An alterity that renders us forever foreign to ourselves and that cannot, as Judith Butler says, be tied to the conceit of a self fully transparent to itself. Perhaps we've reached here a central part of the very evaluative framework of transparency, the iron structure, as it were, supporting all those fragile panes of glass, the so-called knowing and knowable subject. <coughs> but if critical thinking involves questioning our taken-for-granted frameworks, then perhaps we've begun to see how assumptions of knowability structure the very way we think about our research, the very way we understand and make sense of the people and the experiences we're investigating. We might need to acknowledge there can be other kinds of knowing and knowledge that circulate outside the dominating epistemology of transparency. As I hope the practices of poetry and psychoanalysis show, Knowledge can come about by means of something other than the disclosures mandated by transparency. Both poetry and psychoanalysis suggest that opacity or secrecy can be productive rather than repressive, creative rather than constricting, integral rather than marginal. Along the way, we might remember that Glissant's clamour for the right to opacity is framed within what he calls a poetics of relation. To approach something poetically is, I think, to approach it by way of indirection, perhaps as something that is like knowledge, that can be known experientially by imaginative act rather than cognitively by intellectual force. I do want to avoid here any idea that Glissant's right to opacity means resorting to romantic, woolly notions of the inscrutable, the unreadable, or the ineffable. Instead, I take the notion of opacity to mean acknowledging the sheer intractability of what and who we investigate. It means engaging with an order of knowledge that is not always reducible to information, nor to established normative meanings. So perhaps as researchers, we might consider adopting a poetics of relation as a critical practice, a mode of attention, or an ethic that offers a powerful counterweight to, correction of, 
and barrier against the homogenizing discourses of well-being and evidence-based practice that so easily claim us and our research subjects as knowing and knowable. A poetics of relation will ensure we read texts and people with particular care and attention, that we address rather than avoid ambiguity and difference. It insists we acknowledge and embrace the limits of what can be seen and known, and it helps us resist the easy assumptions of knowability within our settled epistemologies, our traditional frameworks, and our foundational certainties. <clears throat> and just as there are no universally established meanings in language, we might remember there's no universally agreed definition of transparency outside the discursive formations or political contexts that invoke it. Which is to say transparency is not like the weather, it's not a natural given, but rather like all our research practices, historical, contingent, contextual and contestable. And as we've seen, there are forms of disclosure that can offer a kind of knowing that's more intricate, more complex than the kind dreamed of by transparency's standardizing philosophy. Finally, I hope you will not think I'm making some simplistic suggestion that reading poetry will necessarily make us better researchers. <coughs> it it seems strangely radical to consider a poetics of relation in the context of a research seminar. Perhaps this is because it's become hazardous in our neoliberal universities to critique the prevailing business ontology that shackles so much of our thinking and being. If it seems risky to speak of modes of disclosure that do not rely on transparency, perhaps this is because the implicit kind of knowing that emerges from the work of careful reading, listening and interpretation is along with the humanities themselves considered less valuable than the explicit kind of knowing assumed to emerge from the STEM subjects. But cultivating a poetics of relation with psychology researchers may stimulate a potential within us that speaks not to power, profit and achievement, nor to the rapid promulgation of marketable forms of knowing and knowledge. Rather, I think it will nourish and sustain a practice of slow, critical thinking and reading, something too often deemed surplus to the requirements of an entrepreneurial university. A poetics of relation will allow us to question rather than foreclose the terms and conditions of our research practices, to imagine our research otherwise, and to think again about whether and how transparency matters. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>
on a number of things. And I think I say this, and I think maybe this is quite an interesting debate to see how we play this out. Because, and I think where my disagreement comes from is that I feel that there's conflation in what you're saying between the striving for transparency and the uh, assumption or the expectation of transparency. Or rather that, I think there's a difference between the idea that through transparency, we can move towards some deeper understanding, which for me, perhaps as a kind of critical realist standpoint, I was thinking about critical realism here, that as a kind of critical realist standpoint, that, that there is a striving, it's a process, that I would see transparency as a process, rather than as an outcome. And I think as somebody who's run RCTs, manualized therapies, <coughs> I don't in any way, and I don't think, I mean, knowing people in the scientific community, people like David Clark, I, I don't think people would see that discourse of transparency as stating truth in some kind of naive, positivistic way. I think more people would see it well, certainly for myself, I would see it as a kind of groping towards something that is a little bit closer to knowledge. And I think, for me, what you're doing, when you, you, you talk about poetry, and I was thinking also about my partner, who's an artist, and, you know, when I talk to her about her art, what she would say is that in her art, she, without structure, without form, without really knowing what she's doing in her, in her artwork, is trying to express something at an embodied level, at an emotional level, I'm not sorry, absolutely, that in some way expresses some, I mean, again, I hate to use the word, but something about truth, mm. or something about a kind of connectedness to something deeper, more complex. Um, and for me, when, you know, the lot of the amazing poems we read, that that is, there is some kind of connection to something um, and again I, I hesitate to use the word truth from a kind of postmodern standpoint but it, it, there's, there's something about some alignment with experiencing or something which connects in some way so for me I guess where I'm coming from is seeing I see transparency I see manualization I see all these systems as ways of trying to articulate something which takes us a little bit more forward in what we can say about the nature of experiencing. And I don't think that is the same as, as a kind of hegemonic claim. And I, I guess what you're critiquing is that hegemonic claim. Well, I'm also critiquing the context in which transparency is produced these days. Because I, I'm sure you're right, um, and, and there's no point in being naive about it. Transparency, of course, does allow us to take things a little bit further, but it's not always introduced in that way, it's not always used in that way, it is often seen as a kind of end in itself. And I think that's where the problem comes. It's seen as a good in itself, rather than as something that progresses us towards something else. Yeah. And that's where I uh, And I think what you're saying is that hegemony in it, and an assumption where actually the underlying principles and the basis of transparency becomes untransparent where it becomes an opa opacity in itself, and it's just presented as a well, it's often used given. to conceal things, as we know. Yeah. We're really familiar with that these days, aren't we? What it looks like, what is it? Thank you, Rosie. I'm really enjoying that. Particularly on the international flavour that can be in the I think you were taking that. It's got me very excited. And then it got me thinking again, similar to what Colonel was saying, although I don't agree totally with what Colonel um, was saying. Um, the idea of uh, transparency being a commodity, interestingly, we spoke about the slave trade, in which slavery was a commodity. Mm -hmm. And then we spoke about Eduardo, who was actually um, in the Martinique. And I wonder if transparency is used as a commodity depending on the continent in which therapy is delivered. So, for example, for some people in therapy, maybe transparency for them is something they don't want, that they are afraid of. And yet the therapist is trying to get them to be more transparent with what's going on. And I wonder if you thought that 
but it also has an international aspect to it as well, which we will do on the end of the show actually. So thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. It's not really crystal, really good question. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the for the thought there. Um, I, I think transparency has become commodified in today's world, and I think you've got to look at something like I Act to see that that's the case, that it's all predicated on being open and transparent, whether the patient likes it or not, by the way. When I was working in an I Act service, I was told if people didn't give their scores, they couldn't get therapy. So in other words, you were exchanging scores for therapy uh, in the name of transparency. Um, and those scores, of course, were being used in all sorts of ways, most of which we didn't know about. And I think that, that can also go on, but there's certainly an element of commodification that's going on in transparency these days. And I'm sure many of you in your placements will be aware. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't know why I'm the one coming up, but I will come. I really enjoyed that so much, and I was thinking about. Um, really influential paper standing in the stasis for the Goldberg. Oh, yes. And how actually for me, having worked in IACT, it seems that one of the criticisms I have is that in the way that everything is labelled and classified and nailed down, um, not only for the therapists working there, or psychologists, but also for the clients coming in, um, unless something can be categorised in that way, it's not worthy of being looked at or seen. And then I think of the Bromberg paper where everything is about the spaces in between, but the work is about what occurs in between that we don't know. Yes. And it sort of chills me to the bone in a way to think about this idea of what you see is what you know, because I actually wonder whether it's more the other way around. What you don't see is what you know. That reminds me of what someone said to Ruben, Arthur Rubenstein told a story about someone who said how wonderfully he played as a pianist. And he said, look, I play the notes just the same as everybody else. But he said, it's, it's the pauses in between that are different. Um, and I, I think that speaks to what you're saying. And I think it's the same with poetry. Yes. And you know, I've tried to smuggle in poetry. Well, Emma and I have had a lot of talks about <laughs> I tried to sneak it in, as some of you would have seen, in spots, you know, maybe a line or two here or there. And I, it doesn't bother me whether it makes sense in the context of that lecture, but it feels something, it, it has a feeling. Mm. This it's is what you're talking about when you read that beautiful few lines, that poem, that's so evocative. Um, for me, that's so memorable, and it's, it's part of the learning experience. Mm. So all of that came up for me. Thank you very much. Well, it's really thanks to Emma that I, I considered poetry at all because it was our conversation, wasn't it? Um, so I think it's just, it's about giving room for different modes of knowing. How do we get at those different modes of knowing? It's very difficult because the modes of knowing that we privilege, certainly as psychologists, tend to be very precise, very articulate, measurable and so forth. So we often have to look to the arts, to our music, drama, art, play therapists, for sort of other modes of knowing and knowledge to get at those, to access them in some way. Other questions? Yeah. Um, <coughs> the negative about IACT is that it is the privileging of transparency that actually gets us into the level of IACT in the first place because things, you know, there's an idea that we need to be transparent with the public funds of the NHS, so we're not going to spend money on something like that. Isn't being to be worthwhile, and then that's where all the nice guidelines and everything else comes from. We know all about transparency with public funds, don't we? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and what, is, what, is, you know, what is considered, mm. and you know, the idea of the crystal palace and glass and smoke and mirrors as well, what's mm. moving that glass and concealing? Mm. Yeah, I think about transparency. Um, we, we don't know, we're not transparent to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And working in, in IAT, which I do yeah, you know, sometimes a week, um, it, it, does, it, does, it does feel that you're assumed to know. And, and if you say something, that's what you mean. And, and <coughs> Chris had to ask 
you know, if they're going to kill themselves every week. And I find that really oppressive. As if someone knows. Like if, if that person will know. Mm. And, 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 and it's, but it's really not about that. It's, it's, it's a lot of it is about protecting the organisation from, uh, you know, some, you know, from the lane. Mm. So we're all this culture of, you know, of trying to uh, pretend that we know. We, we, and, and also, much, if we think that we know, it kind of relieves a bit of anxiety. If we, doesn't, if we, if we don't know everything we can, we know everything, and everything will be okay. And, we and we've demonstrated that. Like yeah, we've demonstrated yes. it, then we'll be safe. We won't be punished for doing something wrong. It's, it's really quite oppressive having to know <coughs> We've got um, Chris. Did you, what, can we, do you want to say something? We'll check we can hear you. Can you hear me? Just about, Chris. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. There was a funny moment there when I put my video on and Nick asked me, have you got a camera? And for a moment, I had to realise that my camera wasn't transparent because I've got the <laughs> security bracket on it. Um, so I had to lift the little thing to make it transparent. I'm sure only Nick and possibly Rosie can see me now. So, so much for transparency. I agree with almost everything Rosie says, and, of all, and I think probably many people in the room know, I've always been very ambivalent about the way core potentially fed into this sort of commoditization and complete myth about what these numbers mean. I guess where I want to raise a little bit of a challenge to Rosie, you're always so eloquent, so immensely impressively read and so on, but I hear something that feels <coughs> like a sort of defense of a particular elite, a particular sort of liberal elite of the poet and the psychoanalyst. Um, and I'd be a little bit more <coughs> pathetic if there was a sense that we were creating more of a space rather than a kind of dimensional position. And I do hear you're saying at times that you're not against certain forms of transparency. But I, I kind of recommend um, Grayson Perry, a little book called Playing to the Gallery, in which he really takes, to some extent, his own trouble with being an artist. And it's rather like this notion of being a poet or an analyst, um, that in a way it immediately creates a sort of tiny hermeneutic cir circle. And I suppose what I have naively hoped for with Core was there'd be some democratization, some proletarianization almost of knowledge about psychotherapy. And I wonder how we can have both, mm -hmm. not the kind of transparency that creates mad commoditization feeds into that and all the hegemony that I think that creates is what he's saying, but without sort of retreating back into the analytic you know, citadel, um, ivory tower, the poetic, you know, Anyway, that, that's my that's my concern. Thank you, thank you, Chris. I, I think it's it, you're you're absolutely right. It's easy to fall into binaries at this point, mm. isn't it? Um, and I had hoped to avoid that, but it's it's difficult. I think when you're trying to mm. to sort of provide a counterweight to the forces that are around us at the moment, and I think that's all I was trying to do was to to provide some kind of countervailing weight against the forces of measurement and manualization. There I'm completely, completely with you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Oh, thank you so much. It's really beautiful and poetic. And it's really Thank you. I, I just wondered, like, I was really interested what you said about the unknown and how we enter into this curious space with our clients. And if we're talking transparency and it's there, and it's in the speak of, of society and it's there, and yet we are trying, we're cultivating something which is elusive, which has a mystery to it, which has that beautiful kind of, you know, we, we can't get hold of it. And actually, we're selling something on that sort of level of, yes, transparency, you're going to know, knowledge is this, you're going to find out something. Then it, it's, it's a bit of a lie, because it's like it's saying that this beautiful relationship that we're creating in therapy 
can be known even, and often it can't be. And um, you know, that you will fix your problems, that we will in this transference, you will be able to have some reparation for something. And actually, that's sometimes not what it is. Sometimes it's just being able to sit with actually, we don't know what this is. We don't even know how to fix things. And I think transparency is a bit of a notion of fixing as well in this sort of way. Mm, thank you for that. I, I, maybe that comes back to something that, that Mick was touching on about truth. Because I suppose I, I like to think about um, therapy is never about truth. But it might be about small little pieces or certain truths that start to emerge and gradually begin to make sense in some way or another, or may not make sense, mm -hmm. but only small pieces at a time, not one great big truth with a capital T. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and maybe transparency in today's age tends to too easily dovetail with the idea of truth with a capital T. Um, uh, and I don't think that's helpful. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, thank you, Nick. Really scholarly talk from Peter Tillerson. I really enjoy your uh, the romp through the genealogy of ideas that you were calling on. Um, you know, you carry through that, 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 that all such inspirational ideas in the way you used it to critique. Um, knowledge, transparency, kind of relation to self, what goes on to therapy. So it is really all, um, you know, a great piece of so thank you. Um, as I was listening to you, I was a bit of your talk the way you were describing language would be something that I would want to take issue with because it seemed to me you were taking a very um, kind of the metaphor of language and how ideas and words and it goes across and it's uh, unencrypted or what is in people's brains and that that might sort of be the model also of therapy that you're kind of pushing up. Um, and, and for myself, the, um, the kind of theoretical idea of, of, of language really is a social direction. Um, I don't think necessarily against what you're saying about this But it seems to be not, you know, in my view, to reduce it down to individuals and use that on an individual mind, there's the things in between the individuals. Mm -hmm. the, the, um, yeah. So, so it was that idea, those ideas of interaction and that's where language gets used that I thought got lost a little bit. And when you were you talking about language as words and, and language and how well, I'm sure we can agree that, that um, language is negotiated between people, and that's why I was sort of quite keen to get across the idea that we can't pin words down to any one particular meaning. Their meaning is always going to be negotiated, and it will mean different things depending on the context of the person. Without the dog, without going to the box, we didn't take into the brain that that the meaning and the relationship that lies outside, and in some ways it's very, yeah, that, that lies with what you're saying. Thank you. Not being able to do Yeah, so thank you. Okay, well, I'm so sorry to say we need to end things there. Thank you so much for um, coming on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Enjoy it's really wonderful to see you. Thank 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 you. And she's going to be talking to us about meaning making in action. She does some really interesting work around meaning uh, with kids. And just to say that um, one of the lovely things about being back in person is that we can go to the pub again after the talk. So, and we're going to be Diego's.
We're going to be celebrating Diego's PhD.